Hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 781. That is 781 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, coming at you live and direct from an undisclosed location somewhere in the depths of London. Hope you're well. Hope you're good. Hope you're fine. Hope you're lime-ish whatever that term is hope you're doing good hope you're doing good how am i i'm doing absolutely amazing i cannot lie as you can tell i'm well hydrated well rested i had a nice session in the gym the other day i'm gonna go for a run later on today in between the two or three podcasts i'm recording in a flipping day like an absolute dog that i am and i'm feeling pretty good i'm not gonna lie for once i'm actually feeling pretty fine pretty loose pretty fine pretty loose over the past weekend, I've still been kind of reeling and celebrating, which is past week actually, uh, May United's victory in the FA Cup final. It's still something I'm kind of getting my head around. The fact that we've been so poor throughout the majority of the season, we end this season okay-ish, finishing eighth, and then we end up beating the league champions and the team that everybody thought was going to destroy us, Man City in the flipping FA Cup final. Absolutely crazy. But anyway, before we get into that, let me update you on some of the things I've been up to in these last few days. So... Over the past weekend, I went out to the good old Brick Lane. Good old Bricky Lane, right? Good old Bricky Lane over the weekend. Have a bit of a walk during Bank Holiday weekend. See the people, see the sights and stuff. And you know what I realised? I realised I hate going to those kind of places. Because I hate personalities. There's something about daytime personalities as opposed to nighttime personalities. I just despise. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the fact that in nighttime because my eyesight ain't great i can hardly see people i can hardly make out their faces i just see their silhouettes most of them are wearing black most of them are kind of like slipping and sliding in and out of flipping clubs anyway so there's not a lot of like standing around and posing under the sun but this past weekend in brick lane yo people were out in force naturally because it was nice weather that place is a good place to hang out there's cool bars cafes places to eat things to look at graffiti wings to kind of take pictures in front of and all of that malarkey and i realized quite quickly that you know what i actually despise personalities that's why i realized why i don't tend to go out to those type of places in the first place i tend to avoid them anyway because just there's just too many too much of that everyone's an individual everyone thinks they look really unique everyone's kind of screaming with what they're wearing right there it's literally everyone's walking around in all caps but every letter is colored if that makes sense right imagine that everyone's in all caps bold underlined but every single color every single letter sorry is colored in a different color and sometimes even the bold underlining has a different color underneath it and i just can't handle that it's just too much personality i need my personalities toned down a bit which is why i kind of like where i live as well i'm kind of out of the mix just regular people and everyone's trying to scream or shove their flipping passion down your throat right because in brick lane you can spot the people far away from far away you can spot oh this person's got a passion for indie indie music this person's got a passion for photography passion for fashion passion for fucking street art passion for sneakers passion for streetwear menswear you kind of see them screaming oh this guy dj like it's just oh it's just too much it's too much i can't do it i can't do it and i guess because maybe maybe it's an insecurity maybe it's a reflection of my own self maybe i think that i scream personality when i'm walking down the street right as you can tell i look very very normal and very well adjusted and very plain and very middle of the road and very normie and very basic bitchy but there's something about being around these type of people that just gives you a bit of a headache I don't know, it was starting to disturb my frontal cortex. I was like, ah. Or it could just be I hate people. That could also be the thing. Maybe deep down, deep down inside my flipping soul, I just despise and hate people. And that's okay. It's okay to hate people. I finally realized and come to grips, come to the understanding that it's perfectly fine to hate people. And maybe I might be that type of person, which is strange because I think I'm very sociable. I'm very friendly, I'm very open, I'm very chatty, um, I'm a bit of a people pleaser, which is something I don't really like about myself, the slight element, I've got 5% people pleasing thing in me, which is why sometimes I do negative re- negatively react to some people that I cover in the pod who are, you know, who have that as a front personality. I think my people pleasing thing is at the back, but it's still something that I'm kind of having to come to grips with. So because of that, I try to avoid all these different places. And also it could be as well, because I experienced it all before. 
I've done all this stuff before, so maybe because I've done it before, it's kind of a bit like, you know, whatever to me. Um, it is quite nice, actually, I'm not going to lie, to walk around that kind of area and see a whole new generation of people, though. I'm not going to lie. You see a whole new generation of folks that I never saw before because I think the saddest thing ever is to go around those type of areas and see the same type of people I was seeing when I was going out. That's not a good thing. That means those people haven't evolved, they haven't progressed, they haven't flipping grown up, they're just still doing the same thing. I'm, I'm glad I don't see the same people around there because if that was the case, I'd be sad. Maybe they see me and think, oh my God, what, what's this boomer doing here? But I'm glad I don't see the same people I was hanging around over there. But when I was walking around, um, um, I think I'll get each to, towards the end, happened to bump into this guy who I thought would look quite cool, personally. But when you look at it a bit further, you're like, oh shit, maybe he wasn't that cool. There was this guy walking past me who had like a, you know, what are those bottles? Um, I think it's like Elephant Foot or Big Foot. I forgot what the what the wine brand is called, but it's some it's a it's a brand that's got like a foot on it. Um, it's a kind of a basic um five pound, ten pound one that you get from Tesco's. And he was swigging on one of those white wine ones walking down the street. But he was kind of holding it, he was kind of holding a bottle. Like he was holding like a bottle of Coca-Cola or like a bottle of like beer. So trying to cover as much as it is possible, which you can't really because bottle of wine is quite a big bottle, but he was still trying to cover it that way. He wasn't holding it like a wine bottle. He was trying to make it look like it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, and he was drinking. I thought he looked quite cool. And it also reminded me a little bit of the time that I, one of the last times I remember being out in Brick Lane with some of my cool hipster friends, um, a few of them who've kind of grown up and gone on to do other things. And one in particular um, who's gone on to Yugo actually Actually, big up Hugo wherever he is now. No, I think he's in Australia, sorry. My friend Hugo, who went on to start creating loads of really cool custom made um hats that he does. You know the kind of like hot boy, no, you know the kind of hot man hat, right? The kind of hot boy hot man hat. He kind of makes those um to order and stuff. Really flipping cool dude. I love that dude. And uh, I used to hang around him quite a bit. It was kind of us, me, him, and Danny and a few other people, like you know, the the, the hips are cool black kids in East London, right? The ones that are just that are just plowing down anything that moved or tempting to. Those guys were I weren't because I was a fucking loser. I was the one that was kind of fighting for the scraps. But I remember when the last times we went out, we were out all night Saturday and all day Sunday morning. And we were just still out, wired, right? In our clothes from the Saturday night. And we're walking around Brick Lane. And we bought and we bought like a bottle of white wine to share between the three of us. I think we didn't have enough money. And we were all taking turns, swigging it, walking down the street. And we felt like fucking rock stars. Now, in, you know, thinking back to it now, zooming back out, we probably didn't look like rock stars. We probably looked like addicts. We probably looked like losers. But at that particular moment, we felt so good. I had like my skinny jeans on, Dr. Martin's jeans tucked into the boots, my little fucking mohair jumper, the black and white striped ones. If you know me back then in East London, you don't know why I'm going with that black and white mohair jumper. You know I was on fucking, you know, cool, hot boy kind of time. And walking down the street, I remember thinking we were looking so amazing. So when I saw that guy, it made me remember that. But it also made me think, oh shit, maybe that's an alcoholic thing, right? Maybe. Like, because at that time when I saw him, it was like Monday morning. No, it was like Monday afternoon. So it wasn't even like Sunday. It was like bank holiday Monday afternoon. And I saw him walking on the street and I was like, oh, maybe that's not such a good thing. That he's casually drinking a bottle of white wine to the face at like 4 p.m. with no one else. Because it's one thing when you're around people, because somebody could surmise, oh, you guys were in the park earlier and you got this bottle left over and you're just sharing it between each other and try to finish it before you jump on the bus or whatever, or before you go home. You know what I mean? But when you just by yourself swigging it, you look wild. And then it also made me think about today, I was listening to a bonus episode of Tim Dillon podcast and he was basically saying that how drinking is only cool up until your mid-20s. Then after that, it becomes cool again when you're like 50 plus. And I think that's kind of true. I think there's some truth to that. And you can believe someone like a Tim Dillon because he was an ex-party boy. He used to do a bunch of coke when he was younger, especially in his teenage years, which is, I, I think it's kind of crazy. But I've heard this story a lot from people who didn't grow up like I did because I grew up in a very conservative, very rules-driven African household. So I wasn't really allowed to do anything. I kind of had to do everything really late, which is a blessing and a curse. But I heard a lot of people who grew up in like, quote-unquote, normal households with no real rules, they were drinking and doing drugs when they in their like teens, sometimes early teens. And I think Tim Dillon says he was literally sniffing lines of coke when he was like 13 or something. I was like, whoa. But the good thing about that sort of stuff is that you get your system really quickly. You do a lot when you're young, but you get your system very, very quickly. So 
when he says, oh yeah, you know what, actually, it's a far better thing to kind of drink until your mid-20s and then give up and then kind of continue on the game maybe in the 50s. I kind of agree with that because I think he's sober now as well. And he said he could he could definitely see himself drinking again when he's 50 or something. But nowadays, he's got no desire to. He doesn't look that chic, doesn't look that cool. And that's very true. Like, have you ever been in a bar and you've seen somebody that looks your age, but they're way more sloshed than you? You're not like enamored. You're only enamored and kind of smiling when it's somebody kind of young. You're not really, you're not really doing it with someone that looks like you. It's like you know, or looks to be in your sort of age range, just sloshed. You're like, Ugh, brother, grow up, man. Like, what going for you, man? Get it together. And I think that's what I kind of saw when I saw that guy. I was like, shit, man. All you need is one example, one reflection of yourself, and then suddenly you start to realize, or no, one reflection of your past behavior, and suddenly you start to realize just how destructive or how weird you looked back then. But in the moment, you don't realize it. In the moment, you really don't. Because again, no one could have told me anything back then. <clears throat> I thought I was the hottest of the hottest. I was walking around the streets with my fucking cool friends, throwing parties, going to all the private view things, like living the life. And I, and I think that's a good thing too, because even though I didn't do stuff when I was early in my years, I feel like because I had a very full and rich sort of like, you know, East London hot boy kind of like cool guy lifestyle thingy, whatever that's called. And I did the whole thing, right? I did the whole corny thing of being a promoter. I did the whole corny thing of DJing. I did the whole corny thing of going to loads of vice parties, of going to loads of ID parties, of going to loads of private view, all that sort of corny nonsensey stuff, right? I did all that stuff. Because I got out of my system early, now I'm not, I don't really have a need for it. You know, I, I'm not really bothered. I don't really care. Um, it's not really something that kind of drives me. And I'm also not trying to prove anything to anybody. So, you know, you can just let the kids do their thing. Because that was the one thing that was quite nice to see. I'm not going to lie. Seeing all the, like, the cool kids out there um, doing their thing, you know, being cool and being young and expressing themselves through their clothing and shit and letting, you know, screaming their personality through their outfits was kind of nice to see. I'm not going to lie. It was kind of nice to see. A whole new generation of people and not any, you know, millennial boomer types like me there trying to hog up the limelight or trying to take up space. Just letting those kids do what they do was kind of nice to see. But I did realize quite soon that, you know what? I'm not a fan of the personalities and I kind of like me staying in my own little weird bubble where I am now. It's kind of isolating. I'm not really in the mix as I should be, which is why I, should, I go to probably clubs a lot. It's probably the only time I feel like tapped in. But, I do like it. I'm not going to lie. I do bloody like it. So big up Brick Lane. Quite a nice time. And and, and the other thing as well that, that was funny. Yo, that bagel shop is still, there's still queues outside that fucking bagel shop, you know? It was fucking jumping. Um, bagel bake. So like, you know, I think they, 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 there's, there's some weird story going on with them. I think I remember reading somewhere. Don't hold me to this, but something about the owners, about the kid killing the owner. I don't know. Something crazy. I'm not even going to try and go into it because I don't really know much about it. But it was kind of wild um, what the story was relating to the fucking bagel shop from Brick Lane. The one with the white sign, not the one with the yellow sign. Although I've heard, even from back in the day, I never, I never actually stepped foot in the yellow sign one. I'm not going to lie. I always, always went to the bagel, the original bagel shop with the white sign. But I did hear that the yellow one has the best, um, what do you call it, desserts. So if you want cakes and stuff, the other one is obviously better. But yeah, the, the queue outside that shop was fucking wild. Um, was kind of sad to see the that when next to the bagel shop is at the top of the road on the corner. There used to be like a wine bar, cocktail bar thing that's completely closed down. It's prime real estate as well. It's all boarded up. I never understand that sort of thing. Like, why go on for that? It's a it's a shop. It's in prime, it's, you know, I think prime real estate area over there. But it's completely boarded up. Like, no one, you know, no other, no one's taking it over or anything. It's just been left to flip and ruin. I don't really understand why that fucking happens all the time. It's a really, really, really ideal location to have a store. Um, I, I would assume. Again, I don't, you know, I've never owned a store. So maybe I'm talking out my ass in this regard. But I think it's a really good area. But for some reason... No one's taking it up. So that was kind of sad to see. But I did happen to get these glasses, as you can see here. These new shades that I kind of am donning now at the moment. They were also purchased on that street for £10. You know, these little novelty glasses I bought to kind of mix up my look on here. If you're on podcast and obviously, you know, annoy some people who don't like some of my coggles, some of my goggles that I wear, especially when I'm critiquing fashion people. It's always funny, isn't it? Because I'm critiquing all this stuff on my pod. And then, you know, I've got these fucking very old, very dated clout I think they're called clout, clout goggles. They call them clout goggles on my fucking face. But I love the fucking, you know, I love the contrast between the type of things. But anyway, um, had a good time. Had a fucking good time. Cannot complain. So over the last, what, week and a half or so, um, Rihanna's been on a bit of a promo drive for her Fenty 
beauty brand. Um, she's been out all over the world promoting it. And recently she went to, I think, Shanghai um, to go promote her brand. And um, she's been get she's you know, she's been getting a lot of kind of viral attention there because of the outfit she's been wearing, but mostly because of her ability to recognize old school fans and faces. It's quite unprecedented. So this one particular video went kind of viral on my side of the interwebs, where Rihanna is seen, you know, walking through some area where she's promoting her brand, and she happens to spot somebody in the crowd that she recognized from back in the day, and kind of goes over and hugs this person. It's a really cute video. Let me show you what I mean. Hey, love it. So most likely this guy, I don't, know, I don't know much about Rihanna's fan base. I don't know much about her stands and stuff. But imagine this Asian dude is somewhat, you know, probably an Asian correspondent over there when it comes to Rihanna's fan club. Maybe a very well-known person with a Rihanna stan account. Whatever it may be, um, Rihanna remembered this guy's face from all those years. Imagine all the people Rihanna's bumped into throughout her flipping career as a pop artist. And obviously even more so now with her career um, doing business and whatever it may be. So many events, so many flipping red carpets, so many shin digs, so many chin wags, whatever maybe she seems to have this really uncanny knack for remembering her face now some people describe it as like an you know old caribbean auntie thing which a lot of them have i think my parents are like that as well even though they're not caribbean they're african they do have that thing about just recognizing faces which is why it was always kind of funny when we were younger and you maybe see your parents outside and you try and act like you didn't see them they'd be like brah I, you came out of my body, man. I know how you walk. I know the shape of your back. I know everything about it. I can see you. I mean, you can't just pretend you didn't see me type of thing. So that was always fucking hilarious. And when you go back home, you usually got in way more trouble than you would have if you just would have said hi to your parents in front of the people, um, you know, that you're probably not meant to hang around with. But anyway, with that being said, I thought that was a pretty cool video, right? And I really did kind of enjoy it. And I thought it was, um, it kind of went to sh kind of show you, I don't know, the human side of Rihanna. It was meant to show you like how kind of chill, laid back, you know, down to earth she appears to be despite her being a mega celebrity billionaire type woman she doesn't seem to be super stuck up or super up on her own ass or whatever it may be so i tweeted what i what i tweeted on the screen and i read it to you if you're not watching um, the actual video i said how is rihanna this nice to random fans out in china but juliana huxtable basically told me to fuck off with her eyes when i tried to say hi when i bumped into her at the panorama bar the embarrassment was real but we move now in this particular tweet i don't think i was being mean by sharing this story that i've shared i think on this podcast a few times and i shared it more so in the perspective of being kind of embarrassed and also kind of understanding that maybe in your head wherever the interaction is you're thinking of in it like I, I think sometimes when it comes to like interactions with well-known people let's not call them celebrities let's just call them celebrities because that's the best way to kind of describe it just to kind of give this story context and to kind of make it make sense i think when you're thinking about interacting with a celebrity the more you think about it the less you should probably do it because i feel like the thinking about it kind of gets you in your own head and then that kind of translates how you act and that can kind of weird people out especially when it's a woman it's just a different kind of interaction. I just think you have to be a little bit careful about how you interact, especially at night, especially in nightlife, especially in a club like Panorama Bar Burger. You know what I mean? It's just a different type of vibe. You have to kind of watch your P's and Q's and whatever. So I probably should have been a bit more mindful of the situation I was in, the scenario, and maybe left it to a, like a little kind of, you know, salute from afar and not kind of went up to her, do you know what I mean? And kind of, you know, got in her grill and shit type of thing. Maybe that's what I should have done. Now, in my defense, I don't remember I don't remember me being overtly pushy, overtly in her face, or whatever it may be. But again, I was under the influence. I can't really, you know, cat I can't really say categorically that I didn't do X, Y, and Z. I can't really remember. But I don't remember me being like out of hand. I just remember being like, hey, what's up? You know, blah, blah. Um, and trying to say something nice. Or what, I forgot what, what type of like quick word I tried to say. And not being met by the nicest, warmest reply. Which is a kind of a contrast because I think five minutes before that, I think it was N. Balkama, N. Balkman, N. Balkhammer, sorry, I forgot how you pronounce his name. Um, the resident, obviously, over there at Panorama, but he does usually pr um, plays there. And um, he was really nice. Um, God Jansen also, I met like towards the toilet area clearly come out of a toilet cubicle you know my eyes darting all over the place and he was really chill so it was a really weird contrast between those two guys and her now again they're two white dudes they're, they're dudes it's probably a different interaction different type of vibes whatever it may be and there's a story i keep sharing because i find it so embarrassing and so funny but it's also for me like a cautionary tale just leave people alone
I've said this before many times on here and I've kind of been very strict about it apart from, you know, sometimes a DJ might re reach out to me on DMs and whatever and say hi for me covering a certain thing or just, you know, maybe tell me, you know, keep doing what you're doing, which is one thing, which is nice to kind of see from time to time. But in terms of me going out of my way to kind of, you know, try and make friends with these people, it's never really been my MO really. I never really cared about that sort of thing. I'm mostly in it for the raves and the vibe. So I'm not really, I, I don't know, I'm not really like DJ celebrity obsessed, um, which I probably should be. Maybe it would help help get entry to certain type of places but i don't know i like being a commoner I, not commoner i like being a regular raver right i love being a pedestrian i love looking at this stuff as a fan i'm not an industry head at all zero i know nothing about the industry i just kind of comment on what i see on the internet so it's kind of nice to see anyway i tweeted what i tweeted there about rihanna and her interaction and maybe it was a bit mean a bit underhanded to include that juliana huxtable kind of anecdote but it's also just something that i tweeted on my twitter i didn't tag or anything i mean i'm not looking for a clout just something i just commented on my own side of things well unfortunately for me unfortunately for me it did get the attention of one juliana huxtable and she i don't know she wasn't too pleased i don't think so she tweeted um she quote tweeted my tweet and just put question mark nothing else no comment no like clarification no nothing no and no nothing no even words the same type of response that I got in real life, I got the same one too. Do you know what I mean? That's a funny thing. So people might people might want to contest my version of events and might want to paint me out to be like a bit of a misogynist, a bit rude, a bit presumptuous, blah, 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 blah. But this tweet reply basically encapsulates how I felt at the in the interaction when I bumped into a panorama because legitimately I was so hyped. I was on a dance floor. She had just finished playing. I caught the last like hour or something. And I was really, oh my God, this she's so fucking sick. Da, 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 da. So hype, so hype, so hype, so hype. I decided to, you know, in that hypeness to go over to her and say hi when the, when I said finish. I think I just left the toilet. And I think I actually just had said hi to like Gerdy Answer or something. I came from the panorama about Panama Bar toilets. I was walking back to the Panama Bar dance floor. I saw Gerdy Answer standing there in his button up white shirt next to the couches near the toilets talking to somebody. I said, hey, um, I'm a big fan. He said, "Yep, no problem. Um, thanks so much for your support." Headed over to the dance floor, and I saw Adrian Huxtable standing next to like the the pillars with somebody else. And again, it's it's seared in my brain because I'm I remember how it felt, and I remember going over to her and saying something like, "Oh, like, hey, a big fan. I love the set. Some something to those kinds of effects." And I remember her just turning around and just like looking at me, like, "Who the fuck are you?" Like, it was just like a really like, uh, okay, like yuck like kind of like she was surprised that no uh, to read into it kind of like um you're surprised that that's your fan like yuck i don't want that to be my fan do you know what i mean like, like some also that's what i felt like anyway i could be wrong i could be fucking reading into it too much but that's how i felt and um i think this tweet basically is a representative representation sorry of that interaction because you know no one's saying that she has to act like fucking rihanna right no one's saying that but i think what i was trying to get at with my tweet was that how is somebody as famous as Rihanna who has so much, um, you know, who has so many people kind of trying to get in her face, loads of clout goblins and just needy people and stuff. How is she this personable? Even if it's fake, even if it's performative, yet somebody that you would describe as a sort of micro celebrity doesn't have any, <laughs> doesn't feel any way of like just dismissing you completely. That's that's the thing, because you would imagine that interaction I spoke about with Julian Huxtable, you can imagine that happening with Rihanna and it would make more sense, right? It would make a lot more sense. Okay, cool. Rihanna's like kind of a bit standoffish, a bit cold, doesn't really like interacting with people. It's just not really, I mean, it's not that much friendly. So you can you can kind of get it, right? The amount of time she's kind of had people kind of get in her face and want the hug and whatever, da, 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 be a little bit overly friendly, da, 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 da. Cool. But you'd think with somebody as a bit more of a smaller profile that maybe you know, a bit somewhat smaller, a bit more of a hyper specified, you know, narrowed down kind of profile. Because Julian Hospital is still very big in her own way. Um, you'd think they'd be a little bit more nice, a bit more personal, but a bit more warm. Now, to her defense, it was a nightclub. It was a, at some ungodly hour. She is a touring DJ. You know, maybe you didn't have enough sleep, whatever it may be. Maybe my approach is terrible. Who fucking knows? But I just find the reply to be so fucking hilarious because this is exactly how I felt in real life. Now, the uh, funny thing about it was the people in the comments who were lighting me up, essentially. Now, I understand why, because a lot of these people are probably Junior Huxable's friends, but they were really giving me the business in the replies. They were, like, making it seem like I was, I don't know, what they basically made me seem like. But I heard of, I heard of a, 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 a phrase I've never heard of before. It's like, what's it called? I think it's mis misogynoir. 
which is basically being misogynistic to like black women. It's like, huh? Like, okay, whatever, right? But so, you know, look at people in the comments. Um, you got Frankie from um, what you call it? I forgot what the fucking uh thing was called before. Uh, from this woman, which is now disbanded, saying you're literally so nice to me. Um, shy boy saying basically told me to fuck off with the eyes. I'm sending me's. I don't know what that means. Um, I ran into you and Shy Boy again. So Shy Boy was so disgusted by what I said that Shy Boy commented the next day. I ran into Junior Huxtable and from her eye contact, I knew she wasn't going to offer me one of her kidneys. That's not what I said, basically, right? I didn't, I obviously didn't say that. I obviously tried to make it seem as self-deprecating as possible. But again, you realize on Twitter that no matter how you word things, if people want to under, if people want to understand it the way that they want to understand it and take offense to it, they're going to take offense to it. So that's why sometimes I feel like now I get why people just let it ring on Twitter because people just are going to interpret how you say things the way they want it to be interpreted so that they can get annoyed. You know, they're kind of looking to get pissed off because um, I could obviously because I mentioned their friend's name. They don't want to see their friend get trashed, especially for a black man, a straight black man who they kind of see as the enemy. I'd, Im I'd imagine maybe that's the case. I don't really think so. I, I would hope not because that's kind of lame as well. But, um, you know, you never know. Um, another person, DJ Swisher, uh, replies back with a crying face emoji. Another person says, um, how can you tell someone to fuck off with their eyes? I need to learn that immediately. You know what I mean, though. You know exactly what I mean. It wasn't the most friendliest of um, interactions. She definitely didn't make it. She definitely, she definitely made me aware that I shouldn't stay any longer in that particular area that she was in. You know, <laughs> you know, some people like invite you in with their smile, with their eyes. Oh, yeah. Hi. Nice to meet you. What's your name? Like she made it seem like, yeah, you said you're high. You said your thank yous. Now go on your way, boy. Which is again, which is OK. You don't owe me nothing. But I just thought, you know, it was a bit out of order a little bit sad personally but hey what can you do um river moon says whoa another person here says i ordered the poster and i either never received it or someone stole it our mailbox is on the street crown heights in brooklyn i don't know i just want a poster it's been two years okay i don't know what this person's talking about another person says was it with germans him and the limo girl gotta be roommates i'm not german but okay another one says meanwhile the eyes at panama bar aren't even looking the same direction that's that's a good point to be fair Maybe I didn't remember it, right? Maybe I was too fucked up and I actually didn't remember what happened and I'm kind of projecting and I'm kind of, you know, whatever it may be. That that could be possible. Um, another person says, you said it with your eyes. Again, laughing at the whole thing. Another one says, LMO, is everyone okay? Another one says, I've never been so much, I've never seen so much insecurity in one tweet. What the fuck? But that's the whole point of it. It is a lot of insecurity, but that's the that's the whole point. It's meant to be self-deprecating. It's meant to show a little bit of insecurity. It's meant to show a little bit of vulnerability. But for some reason, it's been seen as me kind of taking the piss or insulting somebody. I don't know. I don't really know. I really, 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 really don't know. Um, another one says, um, you should always go out of your way to hug and fawn over every single person who glances your direction. Again, I didn't glance at <laughs> I didn't glance in her direction. I went up to her and said hi, and she was not very warm. That's it. It's not like I, I didn't glance over. What? Glance over? Okay, cool. And that was Mr. Cakes. You know, I don't know what that means. Another person here says, Lord, that one needs help. Cool. I guess I need help, which is true. I probably do need some psychiatric, psychological, psychiatric help. Another one says, with her eyes, question mark. Another one says, he'll, he'll always have a bounce blank or praise to queens making our dance for a saver. Don't know what that means that got all that from they got all that from one look why are people making it seem as if like you can't you can't transmit a, things with look that's a really good emoji by the way that's a really good gif the weekend in that vid music video you're yeah? scaring the scaring the girls and everyone says i don't know you were pretty nice to me when i came up to me at Car when i came up to you at carmelo's um but yeah um cool and everyone says the nerve smizing for self-care and everyone says insane Basically, no one, you know, no one's really agreeing with me, which makes sense because it's her tweet. You're one of the nicest people I've ever met. I was a fan of. Another one says LMFAO. Another one says I'm... So, essentially, everyone's kind of agreeing with the way that she um, had maybe reacted to me in the flipping club. Now, all this to conclude with this as follows. I think as a general rule, personally, I think as a general rule, you should probably not try to meet people that you look up to on the internet or people that you're into or people that you're fans of. Just let it be a communication or an interaction that you kind of deal with online. And then if you have those rare occasions where you bump into them in real life, and it happens to be cool, a great. But don't go out of your way to try to introduce yourself, to try and be friendly with people. It's not necessary. It really isn't. Because most of the time, nine times out of 10, it's an everyday experience for them. It's work for them. And it's not that much of a, it's not as a, they don't care about the interaction as much as you do. You're putting way more, 
of your hopes and expectations into it as per you're just another to them you're just another face right that they see in the festival scene the club scene just relax so i think that's what i've taken away from it so even though i don't think i was in the wrong i understand how i can kind of be viewed weirdly for saying what i said relating to the rihanna thing i could have just said oh rihanna was so nice to her fans and not mentioned junior huxley boy in there but it's something that's always been on my back of my head because of how much how embarrassing the situation is which i kind of detailed of course in the tweet they're being self quite self deprecating about it but i also can understand why somebody else especially her could view it and be like oh this guy no one yeah i was right to treat him like a piece of shit because look at one of the things he's talking about he's still commenting about this months you know this has maybe happened two years ago or three years ago and they're still talking about it. so maybe she's like yeah i was vindicated i was right to call you know to kind of give him fuck you eyes of my I was, tr I was right to tell him to fuck off with my eyes because look, he's still fucking talking about this situation that happened fucking ages ago. So I can understand why they're thinking that way. I kind of get it. But, you know, I would have just hoped it would have went another way. I would have hoped it would have went another way. But again, like I said, I think it's a good lesson for all, a good lesson for me especially, to just kind of leave those interactions to be what they are on the interwebs. You don't need to always try and be friends with people. Um, I don't ever try to be friends with people anyway, to be fair. I do just try to kind of acknowledge people's greatness and say, oh my God, that was fucking amazing and just keep it moving. I think I'm quite good at that kind of like stop and chat type of thing, keeping the interaction short and sweet and moving on. I rarely even ask for pictures or like DMs or whatever. I'm just kind of, you know, just kind of giving you a head, a kind of a salute in real life. But also understand I could be the, I could be the 1,000th person that's done that. I could be the 200th or the 12th. Either way, it's annoying because you've had to interact with people by force in that kind of way all the time. So I kind of get it. So I understand I completely, completely understand. Oh yeah, and on the subject of DJs doing cool things, on the subjects of DJs doing cool things, I've noticed a bit of a trend happening now in recent years with DJs now wearing studio headphones to do their DJ sets. Now, I'm not too sure if they wear them specifically when they're doing like live stream sets only. I've seen a few of them on Hall. I've seen a few of them on this elevator stream thing that I've got here on the screen. I've seen a few of them on Lot Radio. But I've also now seen the one and only Dem Jeans from How Long Gone um, playing with studio headphones while he was playing at this um, indie festival somewhere. I forgot what the name is, but they covered it on the podcast. If you want to listen to How Long Gone, one of my favorite pods out there, you should know what I'm talking about. And he's standing there playing in these, um, I think they're, like, they're so um studio headphones i forgot what the name of our what the exact name of them are but basically similar to the sennheiser ones i have now um and then uh, i think this guy has i forgot the name of them there's, it's like an a brand but they're studio headphones as well really chunky kind of big studio headphones basically are the ones that usually cover the cups of your ears uh, they're usually quite big they usually have really nice soft cushioning to allow you to kind of use them for hours on in if you're in the studio monitoring your tunes or whatever it may be and i'm seeing a bunch of people now waiting for dj sets now the one thing that's really interesting about this new trend is that most of the time, two headphones were never worn like this because they're kind of chunky and clunky. And the whole point of like wearing DJ headphones like HD 25s and some III ones or like the Phonon ones that I um, should be getting again because I think flipping Phonon lost my order when I actually got these reordered because I've got another ones um, that I bought from Mute in the Noise um, back or that I got given as a gift from Mute in the Noise that are fucking brilliant. But I've also got these coming in very, very soon, the all black ones. But the whole reason of wearing these type of headphones, right? And these particular ones, these Sennheiser, um, the kind of classic um, ones that everybody kind of knows the hd 25s is that because they're really small because the cups you know the 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 kind of the ones that you listen to the earbuds are really small the cups on them you can kind of quickly take them on and off and they're usually quite flimsy on the on the strap itself and they're just a little bit more comfortable and easy to use if you're djing and stuff right because you just need to monitor you don't need them to be worn all day long you just need to have some nice direct sound into your earlobe and you kind of move them around and they're obviously easily packable as you can see with these particular fallen ones they kind of flip they kind of got a hinge on here so you can kind of flip the clubs in, inside and kind of have them in a nice kind of pouch without them kind of getting fucked up and shit but obviously with big studio headphones you don't have that you know luxury so they're kind of clunky and whatever maybe but a lot of djs nowadays carry quite big bags anyway when they're going places so maybe the need to carry small headphones doesn't really matter because you're carrying a big bag anyway and the sound probably is a lot better on the studio headphones than it would be on the DJ pair of headphones. Because I remember, I'd imagine a DJ set of headphones are just highs everywhere. Highs in the highs, highs in the mids, highs in the bass, just to give you that nice, loud, searing noise so you can kind of really hear the difference of what you're hearing through the headphones in through the fucking monitors on the fucking DJ booth when you're there. And maybe they look a little bit better too when you're behind a booth and it kind of mixes up the look because everyone's so used to seeing HD 25s worn like that. But the only thing I don't like about studio headphones is that they're really chunky and they usually make your head sweat a lot more than 
you know, regular DJ headphones would. So I think I might still stick with mine, but I'm kind of liking this trend. I might have to kind of check out online, not these particular ones, because I kind of like using these for my podcast in general, but I might need to check out online to see what the most, um, what the entry level studio headphone head ones are. There's quite a few of them. I think there's these two um, that they're wearing. There's also the other ones that I've got like a velvety type of cup. I forgot what that, what that brand is called. Um, velvet. It's like a velvet or silk bud. Um, headphones i forgot the name of them what everyone kind of wears on pods and stuff you see a lot especially the guys in amp that streaming crew yeah that's the one's called um so this one um the buyer dynamic these i've also seen people wear these behind a the booth too which is flipping crazy to see people wearing these type of things but i've, I've literally seen people wear these headphones what are they called be buyer dynamic headphones they've got these really nice silk almost velvety looking earbud things there i'm assuming they're probably sweat proof i'm assuming that's how they kind of wear them and they kind of look like radio broadcaster all day kind of you know wear type of things something that you'd imagine someone would be wearing when they're behind the fucking keys or behind the mixing board themselves but yeah these big chunky strap one type of things are kind of becoming a little bit more popular now nowadays um i did go to um the young vna and i did see these actually let me see if i can find them young vna uh headphones so there's these little cups that they have in the wall i'm not sure if you can see them let me see if i can see gallery gallery headphones there's which i think will be quite cool as headphones to like wear as a dj to be fair i don't think they have them available here but i might have to get a picture and put them up on the screen but essentially what they were were these like headphones that just the cups themselves that were strapped up to the wall with this nice little metal kind of like bendy snaky cable thing and you could kind of listen to what was going on there and for me it was kind of similar to like the headphones that people wear i think it's like a fun on i think it's fun on, it's like a stick headphone right stick stick dj headphone like you see a lot of people wearing this type of particular one where it's, it's sort of like the stick thing that you hold up to your ear now i actually wouldn't mind just having forgetting a stick just holding a cup up to your ear like this and be able to put that on the side of your head maybe at the back of the cup having a little divot so you can kind of or a little cushion so you can kind of rest it on your fucking head for on your neck and kind of listen to it as you mix in because you don't really lift you need to listen to the whole thing in both ears you just need to make sure that you know it's kind of matching uh beat matching etc in the in the headphone itself maybe you want to make sure the tone is good or whatever or the or the tunes just kind of you know sync together in terms of a vibe but that might be actually something that i kind of want to develop uh, later on in terms of a product because i really like that kind of thing that i saw in the young vna itself but i'm liking this new trend of seeing djs wear studio headphones as dj headphones out there so big up um this particular dj i forgot his name that was playing at the elevator um set place thing that they're doing now and obviously them jeans as well from how long gone i love to see it i love to bloody see it moving on from that moving on from that moving on from that so we have this pretty crazy article courtesy of ra regarding the one kamal williams now i'm not gonna lie i don't know nothing about kamal williams i've never listened to a kamal williams song in my entire life i've seen his name you know all over the place on places that i kind of check out mix mag dj mag ra on juno whatever right he's you know he's, he's a well-known art artist in that regard but I, I can't lie i've never flipping listened to a tune of his in my entire life the same way that i haven't listened to a kamasi washington tune right you see him everywhere all over the place but i never for once played anything from his um you know discography so i'm not really going to miss out on anything based on this particular headline but it is pretty wild and ra put together a feature this isn't just like a normal news article this is a feature a full-length feature on ra regarding kamal williams accused alleged sexual assault by free william which is free William, which is pretty wild right to think of an electronic you know a jazz artist basically um is now being um, accused of being a diddler so it seems like in electronic music in dance music anything nightlife adjacent if you're a woman you're not safe in it you're really not safe because these guys no matter what genre they're in even if the most like you know the most micro of the, of the micro is celebrity not that well known uh, maybe very well known in that kind of hyper localized sort of community even these type of people have the propensity to maybe do some wild shit according to this article so let's read it and see what these people are saying here regarding the one and only kamal williams so 
London born producer and multi instrumentalist Kamal Williams is often celebrated for his role helping shape South London's contemporary experimental jazz scene. Born Henry G. Williams, he broke through um, the mid uh, to tens with releasing labels such as MCDE, Rhythm Section, and Eagle Records. He formed the duo Yusuf Kamal, whose only album, the critically acclaimed Black Focus, landed on the Brownswood Recordings in 2016. The duo disbanded shortly after, and Williams com- continued as a solo artist, releasing a string of funk driven singles, EPs, as well as a DJ Kicks mix in 2019. Free Women disclosed to Resident Advisor that they were allegedly sexually assaulted by Williams. The Williams allege the women alleged the incidents took place in 2010, 2021, and as recently as 2023. Oh, he's cooked. Maybe you, you could say the 2010 one. Okay, that was back in the day when I was young and I was going crazy in the fame. But you were diddling back in 2023. Yo. A representative of Williams has responded to the allegations saying very serious allegations are untrue and emphatically denied by him and he'll be able to demonstrate the same. Okay, cool. Let's see. So he's going to he's, he's gonna be fighting on his side of things. But let's see what these people are saying. And I guess they changed the names of the people to kind of protect the anonymity because it's got a little asterisk here. So the first account here of Kamal Williams' alleged nonsense behavior. Kylie, November 2010. Um, it says Kylie was set. Oh no! It already starts off with a bomb. Kylie was seventeen. Yo, oh, this guy's cooked. Who still was known as Henry Wu? So Kylie was seventeen when she first met Williams, who still was known as Henry Wu at the time. He was a good friend of her then boyfriend Ted. Williams, ah, oh, Jesus Christ, bro! It gets worse and worse. This is what an ex-girlfriend of a former best friend. So Williams added Kylie on Facebook and started messaging her. I found it weird, but also I was like, ah, he's just being friendly. (sighs) Kylie told Ted, who also brushed it off. Sometimes later, when Kylie and Ted were on a break, she went on to a house party and ran into Williams. It was the first, maybe second time I'd ever actually met him, according to Kylie Williams, was trying to dance with her and made passes to kiss her numerous times. Kylie declined. The next day, Kylie found a scarf in her bag and didn't belong to her. She posted a photo of it on Facebook asking, who put this scarf in my bag last night? It's still here. Williams commented saying it was his and sent her a DM. At the time, oh my God. Oh my God. This nigga planted the scarf in her bag. <sighs> Fucking hell. Devious behavior. What? <laughs> like, is this, what do you think this is? Do you think this is like a mistake? mucking around fucking around with a bag you just saw it on the floor you put like or is this like a legitimate thing you know what girls would do back in the day where you'd purposely leave a little earring under the, the, the couch so that the guy wouldn't fucking ghost your one night stand you um the next day she found a scarf williams commented saying it was here instead of dm at the time he was using one of his facebook burner accounts honestly man women are just like sometimes women have really good intuition but they never listen to it this was screaming weird to her from the moment he messaged her the first time. That first paragraph, she already sensed this guy was on some nonsense. She should have immediately blocked. Do you know what I mean? Women have good intuition, but sometimes they don't act on it. I don't think men have any, right? We just fucking go by the seat of our pants or we get led by our fucking penises. But she had good intuition. She felt at the beginning, this guy is not on good terms. He's not on good... Man, I don't like this person. <sighs> anyway, whatever. Uh, let's continue. Um... He was using one of his Facebook burner accounts. Kylie suggested that they meet somewhere, but he invited her to his place to drop off instead. William said his little brother was at home and that he couldn't leave him by himself or bring him along to meet her. Kylie agreed to go to William's house the following day. <sighs> I don't know. Come on, girls. Well, he tried to lip you at the party the other day. Your friend of your ex girlfriend of that. Like, come on, girl. What are you doing, man? Going to his house. What are you doing? As soon as she got through the door, Kyle said Williams attempted to kiss her. At first, she refused, then relented and kissed him back. And then really quickly, we hadn't even left the hallway. He turned me around, pushed me against the wall to a coat rack, held his arm on my back and tried to pull my leggings down. I pushed him away and said, no, I'm not having sex with you. It's just that we go up to his room. I was like, no, I'm not having sex with you. It's just that we go and sit on the sofa. Honestly, man, I know you're only 17, but come on, bro. Kylie said Williams offered to make her a cup of tea. <sighs> Ah! which she says she diffused the situation and made her feel more at ease about staying she recalls that she went into the kitchen for a moment and when he came back he sat next to her on the sofa and attempted to kiss her again honestly you should have maybe you know what you do on those type of occasions because sometimes women are afraid you know men obviously are stronger and stuff and in terms of kind of overpowering you maybe getting physical 
Maybe that time when they go and make tea, you also make an excuse to go to the toilet and you just leave. He's not going to chase you down the street to look like a psycho. Most of the time, you all right? you're probably better off doing that. Oh, you're going, to, okay, cool. Um, can I use your toilet? Yeah, cool. And just quickly leave. Because it won't be weird for you to carry your bag either because women always carry their bag with them. Take your bag with you and just leave. He then lifted my legs up over my head. What? He then lifted my legs up over my head, held his arm on them and pulled my leggings down. This all happened so quickly. It probably lasted the best part of four minutes and then he was done. So what? She got raped, she's saying. She's she saying she got raped. I was nervous about fighting back in any, any physical way because I was nervous about him getting aggressive. He was very manipulative and pushy. I kept telling him to stop, but he still did it. Then he got up and left the room. I was just like, did that just happen? Oh my fucking God. Holy shit. She's basically saying he raped her, isn't it? Yo. Yo. This guy was doing this at 17 years of age. Could you imagine what he must have done before this? Because, you know, there's no such a thing as like first time, you know, first and only offenders when it comes to sexual assault. It doesn't exist, in my personal opinion. Once a rapist, always a rapist. Once a diddler, always a diddler. It doesn't ex doesn't exist. Oh, you just did that one time. Yeah, all right, cool. Go bury yourself under a fucking jail. Oh my God. Okay. Um, I kept telling him to stop, but he still did it. Then he got up and left the room. I was like, did that just happen? I pulled my leggings up and sat there for a minute. He came back in and asked if I'd seen his keys. He found them and then said he needed to go and pick up his brother from school. So his brother wasn't even in the house. So that whole thing was a lie. Carl said they walked in silence to the bus stop where William dropped her off. Once on the bus, she began crying and called her girlfriend to tell her what happened. She was like, sure, he raped you. I was like, well, I don't think so. And she was like, well, that's what it was. I was like, well, I don't really want to call it that. You don't want to admit it to yourself. I guess this is one of the hard things about women. When I guess this is one of the difficult things for women when it comes to reporting sexual assaults and rapes and stuff. And probably why the conviction rates are so low. Because the experience is so traumatic, it probably fries your brain and you don't remember it correctly. And because most of the... And because there's this thing that people say... I bet you some women have this thing, which is really sad, right? I bet you some women have this like thing in the back of their mind where they're like, don't ever put yourself in a situation where you might get thing imaging it but it's not always like that sometimes somebody can be very manipulative like this guy was where he's literally planning it out from the house party that they were at before putting the fucking scarf in the fucking bag you don't you shouldn't feel like you put yourself in that position because in a normal interaction if that's a friend of a if that's a friend of an ex-boyfriend that's a fairly normal thing hey your scarf was in my bag because he knows you you're his friend you're kind of his friend by default of being a girlfriend of his um friend then obviously him putting his scarf in your bag isn't a bad thing. That's particularly fine. And him going to pick it up at, or, you, or you going to get, drop it off to him on your way to go somewhere else is not a bad thing either. Or maybe you're going to have a drink as you drop Like there's nothing wrong with that at all. Zero on the surface of it. But I guess because a woman puts herself in that position, sometimes when you remember what happened, you can maybe start to blame yourself. You start to victim blame yourself in terms of what happened, which is kind of hard for you then to piece together what happened and kind of be able to put a police report together and maybe some days have gone by since those incidents happened or maybe you just don't want to accept this happened to you because you don't want to seem weak or that you got taken advantage of so uh, when guys are out here saying oh where's the police report no one got convicted it's like bruh it's very complex a situation and it's actually quite you're you're overly simplifying a very traumatic a very intense a very mentally debilitating thing that can really fuck with your brain which is why people don't go. And, and I'd imagine too, probably this is probably another thing as well I never have before. I'd imagine too, there's probably some women out there that know what a rape conviction can do to somebody. They know what rape allegations can do to a guy's life. And they just are really hesitant and very wary and very hesitant to throw it out there. Which again is wild because you should you shouldn't be thinking about them. Think about yourself, right? You're the one that got fucking assaulted. You're the one that got disrespected, right? You're the one that got fucking abused. You're the one that got fucking taken advantage of. You should be thinking about only yourself. But some, I bet you, some women have the fucking grace, have the, I don't know what that is to like think of the guy and think, oh, you know what? I don't want to put this on his jacket because maybe it was me as well. Maybe I egged him on. It's like no, 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 no. This guy's been a monster since he was seventeen. 17 years old these are free accounts by the way right allegedly free accounts that have come on the record and they've changed their names think of the people that didn't want to come on the record or change their names fuck man this is fucking horrible jesus christ 17 years old <sighs> um so at a time i never reported the alleged rape or publicized in any real way 
but I did always make a point to tell people about it. Um, when William's name came up amongst friends, she would tell them about her encounter with him. I guess it was my own way of warning people about what he was like. She was reluctant to use the word rape. I was 17. I think I didn't quite understand what that was. But she, but she said that there was no mixed signals at William's house party that day. The whole time during it, before it, I was saying, I'm not going to have sex with you. I don't want to have sex with you. I don't want to do this repeatedly. <laughs> Yo, anytime you hear these sort of things, you have to back off as a dude. You just back off. Especially in IRL. Back the fuck away. What the fuck are you doing? <sighs> a few weeks later, William sent Kylie a message on Facebook saying hi, but she never responded. In 2020, imagine imagine raping somebody and still having the the, the fucking teremity to... I don't know. In 2020, Kylie decided to report Williams to the police. The police said, asked if Kylie wanted to take Williams to court. She said no. At the time, she was caring for a young baby and didn't want to add stress to her family. But it was important for her that the police have a report and file. My main motivation for contacting the police was to have the offence reported in case it could be a system investigation. Kylie wrote to a witness statement. RA has reviewed a copy of the official statement given to the Bethlehem Police, as well as an email with the police confirming Kylie first reported letting to the rape in 2020 and later provided a video statement. So she went to the police about this. What did the police do then? Reported the alleged rape brought back all kinds of traumatic feelings. I never really processed it until now. It really gave me a panic attack where it gets brought up in social situations. I bury it. I don't think about it anymore. It's taken me a long time to confront these, to confront it myself. I already have spoken to Clara, the friend of Kylie, during the bus journey on the way home. She confirmed Kylie's account. So there's there's a there's a breadcrumb trail linking back to this friend that she called immediately after the alleged assault. Who confirmed yeah she spoke to me about that and i told her it was rape but she didn't want to admit it because you know because she wasn't ready to protest it just yet so this shit happened and there's obviously a police report from 2020 it's now 2024 yo this kamal williams dude sounds like a piece of shit um jenna august 2021 london Jenna recalls meeting Williams in August 2021 after he played a show at a launch party for a London radio station. She attended it with a journalist friend. I didn't know who he was. He later came over and made a weird comment about my ethnic heritage. It was offensive, so I said I can't talk to people like that. He was kind of apologetic, but I said I'm still not keen on speaking to you. My friends later told me that he was in the band and they'd be interested to talk. <sighs> Clout in it. Ah! All these women had the exact same reaction the first time they met him. It wasn't even like he came in and was super charismatic and really charming and whatever and duped him that way. This guy was a cunt from minute one. So far, it's two for it's two out of three. This guy was a cunt from two, from the minute go. They should have listened to their fucking gut. Should listen to their intuition. They just ran a mile. Imagine walking up to somebody you don't know and making a joke about their fucking heritage. Like what? Who the fuck are you? Do I know you? Do you know what I mean? God damn it, they should have listened to any tradition. Fuck. Anyway, my friends later told me that he was in a band. Jenna said Williams told her he had autism. Oh, yeah, autism. Cool. Um, as though it was an excuse for communicating the way he did. She said Williams then apologized and, and said a big group was planning to visit another bar in central London. My friends had to go and ask if I was okay staying. Until this point, I'd only really had a good experience making a few friends on nights out. I was relatively new to London and a sociable person. Staying out with a new group of people wasn't something out of ordinary and shouldn't have been a problem. So I was fine to stay and it was a mixed group. At this stage, William's behavior wasn't raising alarm bells for Jenna. He wasn't being pushy or forceful, but he seemed to be trying to pursue me. I made it very clear that I wasn't interested and made a point of hanging out with other women in the group. Afterwards, she said that Williams took her number to let her know what the next bar... Oh, man. Come on, man. What are you... Honestly. Oh. Why would you give this guy your number? You already... I don't know. I guess you're just going to be nice, isn't it? But I think a lot of it has... That's the thing. Clout really gets you... Lets you get away with fucking murder, bro. Or maybe looks, I don't know what it is, but clout lets you get away with murder because all these people had the same visceral reaction. This guy's a cunt. I don't care what fucking album he released, what EP is on, what record label is on. He seems like a fucking cunt. They all had the same reaction, but they still went ahead with it because I guess he's well known or something. I don't know. He then sent me a barrage of messages. I was giving him the benefit of doubt as he flagged a couple of times that he was with autism. I send, I know that send people have different types of clouds communication. According to Jenna, she had no intention of staying out late as the next bar was a long way from her home. People in the group encouraged her to join them regardless, promising they'd be to send her a taxi. By the way, the people that were out with her as well, you're pieces of shit too. Because if she made it very clear that she wasn't comfortable with this dude, he already annoyed her in the beginning, like, keep an eye out on your fucking friends, bro. If they have a fucking bad interaction with somebody, maybe step in. 
you know what I mean? Maybe the defences are down. Maybe they don't want to upset the, the harmony of the group because they're the new one there. They don't know who this guy is. He might be well establishing a group. You know what I mean? Whatever. But look out for your friend, bro. Like, God damn. It was very exclusive bar. I would never have gone there otherwise, so I decided to, I might as well go. The night was still young, she said, and she spent most of the evening chatting with the other women in the group. But as the night went on, she claims that Williams became increasingly drunk and repeatedly blamed his behavior on autism. Anybody that tries to use those type of things to excuse their behavior, run a mile also. It's no excuse. Those type of things that you're doing, you're just doing them because that's who you actually are. It's kind of like people say how you act when you're drunk or high. It's usually just on the, you know, what do you think called? an exaggerated version of yourself but it's still an element of yourself um let's continue about the night went on she came increasingly drunk he was talking about religion a lot very incoherent ramblings jenna said she found the bar boring and wanted to leave as it was getting late but williams convinced her to stay for one more drink i didn't see him putting anything in my oh my god oh my god no no i didn't see him put anything in my drink but i don't remember anything after that drink sitting down having a drink with him is the last thing i remember I've been spiked before and recognize the feeling of being spiked. So when I woke up at his place the next morning, not knowing how I got there, I rec- Oh my fucking God. <sighs> I don't know about you guys, but in my experience, in my very, very brief, very rudimentary, very elementary experience of pursuing women, especially in real life, even online, if they tell you they're not interested, very rarely, very rarely, Let's say 90% of the times, there's no way of turning that around. Sometimes, 10% of the times, you might, you might bump into them on a particular night where they're feeling a bit frisky. Maybe they broke up with that person and they bumped into you on that particular day. Cool. You're lucky. The stars have aligned for you. Allah, Zeus, Jesus, God is shining on you. Run amok. Have your fun. And usually it doesn't last any longer than that because they just want to get out of the system, right? They don't really trust it anyway. And you still get ghosted. But very rarely do you go out with somebody in a night out and you start off by making an off a joke, a f an overly familiar joke that they don't like because they're not your friend. And then you try and pursue them and they tell you they're not interested. And then they agree to go back to your house. It doesn't happen that way. Maybe at the most, at the most, you might get a little cheeky bum rub, a little kiss on the dance floor while you're in a club. But they're not going to go from like, nah, 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 back to your place. It doesn't work out that way. Usually there's like, nah, 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 okay, then nah, 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 okay. That maybe is an example. But if somebody ends, if, if this ends up this way, something amiss has gone on. Something any something dodgy has gone on. If it goes from like, nose all the way, and then you suddenly wake up to like, no, no. Something definitely happened there. Something very bad happened. Yo, she got spiked. Jenna said that she woke up feeling disoriented in a place she didn't know. Williams was asleep in the bed next to her. I was like, this isn't right. This is really weird. She said, an, she said an Uber had been ordered on her account and then cancelled. I was still trying to piece together what had happened, but just couldn't. I felt out of it, like an out-of-body experience. I woke up dressed and couldn't remember anything happening, so I tried not to think about it too much. So what's she alleging? She alleging that he tried. she tried to order an Uber, and I guess in the midst of her being fucked up, he must have cancelled it or it got cancelled. So it's proof that she was trying to get home. But, oh no! Fucking hell. I then tried to wake him up before leaving to ask why I was there. But he was so completely out of the count, I chose just to leave. Jenna said she went home around 8 a.m. and received a torrent of messages and phone calls from Williams. He told her that she had agreed to have breakfast with him the following morning before going to pick up his car. She said she didn't remember any of this and wanted to get clarity about what happened the previous night. She agreed to meet him a few hours later at a full st oh, in London. Jesus Christ, bro. People are just too trusting, man. People are just too trusting. Too trusting. Too, too trusting. Why are you meeting this person, bro? Run a mile. He then said he needed to get something from his car. As we were walking towards it, I told him I hadn't wanted to go back to his place with him. But he was like, we did have sex. I was like, what? That was a really weird thing to say. I don't remember. <sighs> I don't remember that happening and said, I told you I didn't want to do that. She recalls him replying, oh, well, I'm autistic. I seem to be shell shaken. I saw it. I seem to be shell shocked, so to speak. I stopped walking, which is when he grabbed me. She explained that Williams then insisted on dropping her off at home. He linked my arm quite forcibly. Really scared and unsafe, I panicked and wasn't able to function normally. It was when I. It was. It's what I've since discussed in therapy as fight or flight, fight, flight or freeze response. My response was being fr was was being freeze in this situation. So he assaulted her a second time. Is that what you're trying to say? 
Jenna said she felt overwhelmingly scared and ashamed. I felt, I guess I felt ashamed and embarrassed that I couldn't leave at that moment, that I couldn't get away to keep myself safe. Jenna said Williams forcibly insisted that she get into his car. She said she didn't want to get into Williams' vehicle, but between him moving up the street and being shocked into the information she just received, I felt really unsafe how to get out of the situation. She said she didn't want Williams to know where she lived, so she asked him to drop her off near a station. Instead, he drove to the opposite direction of the suburban outskirts of southwest London. I did I had not lived in London long and had no idea where I was or where I was going. It just seemed so dodgy. Will, J Jenna said she kept trying to think of ways to leave the vehicle, but I had no clue where she was and felt trapped and were generally scared of this man. In the car, she said William seemed paranoid and rambled incoherently about religion and celebrities hiding their sexuality. It just seemed like he was completely unhinged. I was getting increasingly worried about my safety. His driving was erratic. Jenna said she asked him to drop her, drop her off somewhere and she had to meet a friend, but he just ignored me and just kept getting more angry. Honestly, I was just trying to be nice to him for fear of him crashing and killing me. Jenna said Williams then pulled up outside of a shop and locked her in the car. I don't know why I didn't try to call anyone at this point. I felt dazed and in shock. She said Williams returned to the car shortly after with several boxes of nitrous oxide, laughing gas. He suggested we go to his flat and do some NOS, but I said I had to leave. I can't remember exactly what he said, but the vibe felt very much like I didn't have to say them in the matter. Jenna reluctantly went back to Williams' flat. I kept thinking now, why didn't I just run? I guess he had painted this picture of himself as a sketchy, violent, dangerous character. I was scared he would just chase me and physically attack me. Ah, okay, I see. He he weird. He freaked her out so much that she legitimately was frozen in fear, and she didn't want to freak him out into doing something very drastic and very fatal. So she just played along. But then playing along probably led to more abuse. Fucking hell, man. <laughs> Oh, this is so fucking heartbreaking. She said Williams insisted that she inhale the balloon containing nitrous oxide. He came in he came onto me while I was feeling the effects of the balloon. I said no and he tried to push me him off. Jenna said that she was feeling very really out of it from the night before, therefore didn't have much strength and usually and, and as usual to push him away. He turned me around and forced me over the sofa. I kept struggling. I was still tripping out from the balloon. Um he he was a lot stronger than me. He said that I didn't want him to carry on, but he did. I couldn't get him to stop. I said, I said, sorry, I had said that I didn't want him to carry on, but he did. I couldn't get him off. I couldn't get him to stop. When he finished, he almost instantly pretended to fall asleep on the lounge. I got out there as quickly as I could. Jenna said she immediately blocked Williams' phone number, but then she went to block him on Instagram. She realized he'd already blocked her straight after he, she fled his place. I know he must have known what he did was wrong and fucked up. Otherwise, why behave like this? Looking back, it all seems predatory and premeditated. It makes me sick to my stomach. Jenna considered reporting her ordeal to the police, but said she wasn't confident enough to do so at the time. Friends have had really bad experience with the police where they get blamed for an attack. I'd gone for a drink with a group of people I didn't know, so I felt the police would say it was my fault. I didn't have the capacity to deal with it. As a woman of colour, I also know the experience with police might not be the most favourable either. I had spoken to a friend of Jenna who was leaving with her at the time and um, alleged incidents. A friend confirmed that she had spoken to Jenna the morning after she was allegedly stayed at Williams' place and again the second alleged meeting with Williams at London Bridge. I don't know, man. I don't know. If, if you're on an event and you're on a festival and you're putting this guy still on your lineup, like, ooh, you really don't give a fuck, bro. If you're going to read these accounts and be okay to put him on your lineup for club nights and festivals and shit, you really don't give a fuck. And probably people, if if you see this guy on lineups and shit at parties, you should probably write off the, the party completely and probably look at the promoter another way. Because if I heard about this in the scene and I was putting on a party... I wouldn't book this guy. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I'm a nobody. So if you're putting people on and this is getting spread on one of the biggest fucking dance music platforms out there and you're not giving a fuck, you have some wild skeletons in your closet because these accounts are horrendous. And these aren't even like, you know, sometimes you have these accounts of nightlife interactions or flirtations and sex stuff. And it's kind of hard to really figure out what happened. The lines are blurred, right? Everyone's drunk. Everyone's like, Ugh. but a lot of this stuff sounds premeditated, bro. A lot of this stuff didn't even happen at a club night. Happened like at gatherings with friends and shit. Where you're meant to be safe. You're meant to be around people that you know, you know, chilled environment. Like, 
And this is like, wow. Can you imagine what happened in nightclubs then? What happened, or what people haven't reported about? <sighs> anyway, last one. Sarah, August 2023, Parisian Gulf region. Sarah, or Sarah, I think, I think let's call Sarah. Sarah recounts first meeting Williams in her native country in August 2023. The meeting for him for the second time in London. When I got to London, I made an Instagram post. He saw it and wanted to meet. Sarah invited Williams to meet her at a bar with friends, but according to Sarah, he said he insisted on turning up in his car. She asked him to join her at the bar, but Williams told her he doesn't drink and would prefer to jam at his studio. <laughs> oh, I'm only laughing because this is like textbook creep of behavior in it instead of meeting somewhere public just to hang out have a bar let's go to a private secluded studio somewhere <sighs> excited by this excited because of course it's a musician isn't it i guess <sighs> excited by this prospect sarah agreed to meet to join him but she noticed the vibes were off right away when they arrived at a studio williams revealed that he had been diagnosed with autism uh, the autism thing again so if he acted strangely that was why so what, if you grab their boob, it's autism. If you try to finger bang her in the bar, it's autism. Yo, this guy is a piece of shit, bro. Um, Sarah said Williams played a series of jazz improvisations before abruptly stopping the music and walking out the room. Sarah recalled feeling the urge to leave. He told me he didn't think he'd ever feel this way about somebody and generally didn't know how to process these feelings. Sarah said she tried handling the situation diplomatically, but Williams made three attempts to kiss her. By the third attempt, I was more aggressive. I pushed him off and said he's crossing boundaries. But she said this triggered Williams to question her sexuality and asked if she was gay. Huh? <laughs> this guy is a fucking knobhead. It's like the most... What? It's like when guys... Like, if a woman turns her down, like, oh, yeah, you're not hot anyway. I didn't really like you. It's like, what? Like, you're gay? Like, huh? It was getting weird. I realized this guy who I don't know at all could be capable of anything. So I did my best to remain calm and not let him feel like he's attacking me. You see, this is a sad thing about being a woman, isn't it? Look at the things you have to think about in those situations. You have to think of the aggressor. You have to think about how to defuse the situation just to get out of it safely because you don't want to trigger them into doing something fatal. When in actuality, you should be kicking them in the nuts and running, running a mile. But you don't want to do that because you might trigger something. <sighs> Fuck man Sarah decided to leave But she said Williams insisted on driving her back to her hotel I told him while he was driving me back That I had forgotten my glasses He didn't even respond He literally swerved, U-turned and raced back to his studio The ride back to her hotel She said was the worst ride of her life According to Sarah, when Williams called her the following day, she asked if he was upset with her. Despite her rejection of his advances, I thought he's on the spectrum and maybe I could give him a chance. I was kind of doubting myself, wondering if maybe I did lead him on. Williams went on tour and they continued to speak regularly. So again, these women again, another account of knowing from minute one that this guy was a freak. This guy was a weirdo. This guy was a fucking pest. This guy was a diddler. They knew it. They knew it. They should have just trusted the intuition. They all knew it. He didn't. There's not somebody coming under the guise of like, no. Nah, he he was giving off weirdo vibes from the very beginning. They should have just trusted intuition, innit? They should have just went, okay, cool. Even though this guy's got clout, he's got fame, fuck him. Because you really never know how people are until you actually meet them in real life, to be completely honest. And this is a good example of it. Sarah, Sarah said she agreed to meet Williams in her hometown. But ahead of this, she said that she started to give him real asshole vibes by constantly calling her while she spent time with her family. He began questioning why she wasn't answering her phone. He started becoming extremely demanding. I met him once. I thought, this is weird. Sarah said she reluctantly agreed to pick Williams up from the airport. I said, Honestly, man, how can you go from... How can you go from somebody blow? How can you go from knowing that somebody's being a weirdo? You draw the boundaries. Not interested... I'm with my family. Leave me alone. They keep calling you. And then you still have the decency. And the... Honestly, man. Just these nice people get... It's always lovely people that get taken advantage of, isn't it? She reluctantly agreed to pick Williams up at the airport at 6am. She was expecting him to drop him off at a hotel and meet him later. But he insisted that she stay and accompany him to his room. She said the conversation felt really unnatural and forced. They both got into the elevator and that's when Sarah said Williams tried to kiss her. She he, he literally grabbed my face and kissed me. I was like, oh my God, and backed away. As the elevator doors opened, Sarah said Williams didn't look at her. He simply walked ahead of his hotel room while she walked behind him, confused about what had just happened. She said Williams didn't like the room upon arrival, so he requested to change it. 
They followed the porter to a new room. Once the porter was gone, she said Williams could try to kiss her again. I told him I didn't want to do this, but he still forced himself on me. She said Williams continued to try to kiss her and she, reluctant, she reluctantly let him. He, he is then alleged to have moved her to the bed. I could see you telling him I don't want to do this. I was like, you can't, why can't you accept that I'm uncomfortable? But he said, he, no, Let, let's read that again. He is then alleged to have moved her to the bed. I continued to tell him I don't want to do this. I was like, why can't you accept that I'm uncomfortable? But she said he coerced her into lying next to him and continued to try and put his hands down her pants. He forced his hand and said to him, I told him, I told you, I don't want to have sex with you. Eventually, I let him do it because he basically went over me. <sighs> Fucking hell. So sad. I was saying, okay, please, let's not do this. I don't want to be aggressive. He kept doing it and I was pushing him off. I didn't want to be pushed off. He didn't want to be pushed off. He's a big, strong guy. I was like, dude, I can't breathe. You're on top of me. He grabbed my face and was going at it. I didn't want to go into it much more. Oh, Jesus Christ. So what, like he covered her face or something? Yo. This is wild. I'm not going to lie. This is fucking wild. Holy shit. Holy shit. This guy should be in fucking prison. This guy should be in literal prison. After the alleged assault, Sarah said she left the room when Williams fell asleep but forgot to take her bag with her. When she returned to collect her bag, she said Williams was vomiting. So she called... Again, women, man. Look how fucking caring and nurturing these women are. Look how caring and nurturing women are. Thinking of their feelings trying to skirt around and kind of baby their fucking violent, abhorrent behavior after the fucking alleged rape, still going back to the room and helping them. Like, what the, honestly? It's always, honestly, it's always the nicest people that get taken advantage of, isn't it? Oh, my head. Yeah. Anyway, um... That's why being an arsehole is probably the best thing possible. If you're a woman, being an arsehole off rip, unless you're interested in the person, is probably the best thing to do. Don't give anybody an inch. But when you're not, you're not interested, just be an arsehole straight off. Be a be be happy to be called a bitch from minute one. Boop, 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 block, 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 like that meme. Block it, block it, block it, block it, block that, that woman, right? I forgot what, what channel you with, right? Like, because if not, if you give anybody, especially these kind of guys, if you give them a fucking inch, they will try and take a fucking mile. Um, Williams was asleep again. She let him in the room. Um, and pe- sorry, um, she then returned to cut her bag. Williams was vomiting. She called the hotel medics. Williams fell asleep again, so she left the room to pace down a corridor in a bit to try to understand what just happening. She decided to needed to go. She needed to go home. She returned to her room to again to pick up her bag. But Williams was awake and started begging her not to leave. She agreed to stay, but out of nowhere, this guy tries to have sex with me again. On this occasion, Sarah said Williams was more aggressive and forceful, but I just let it happen. I was like, just let this happen quick, then fu- then get the fuck out. Recording the scene, Sarah said she remembered him opening her thighs. I would close them and he'd tell me how to relax. <sighs> That's words of a fucking rapist, isn't it? Let's just call it let's just call us let's just call it a spade a spade. Anytime you have to tell somebody to relax. That's words of a fucking rapist. I don't think I've ever uttered the word somebody. Just relax. What? Relax. I'm uptight because I don't want to do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're scaring me. Please back off. She said Williams fell asleep again and he immediately, she let me left the room with all her things, rushed downstairs and waited for her car. I wanted to vomit. I was so disgusted. That's when I had a breakdown. I was just crying. That's when it hit me that I had no idea who this guy was or what he was capable of. I was really scared. She added, this is bigger. This is bigger than me. I was very reserved. I don't like calling people out, and I don't want people to look at me like, "Oh my God, you see what I mean?" I said before in the beginning, most guys get grace from. Most guys don't know. That's why I think. That's why I think that in general, this whole there's this whole rhetoric online that there's way more like false rape allegations than than legit ones, and I don't think that's true. I just think unfortunately we live in a society where like there are these like these blanket phrases get thrown about that are really insulting to our intelligence like believe all women it's just an insulting thing to say because you have to take every case by case right you can't just believe everybody just because they say something it's just that's that doesn't make sense logically in our brains but to say that there's more fake rake allegations than legit ones is obviously incorrect 
we know that to be not true like we even know from our own anecdotal evidence or people we've known people we've heard about in our own social group that more than likely there's way more um instances of sexual assault that don't even get um reported because the women are literally giving the guys grace because they know what allegation can do to a guy so because they don't remember it properly because they're so traumatized by the situation and because they don't want to you know put the the person get get the guy in trouble or have themselves be looked at as a victim because they don't want to be looked seen as weak or be seen as vulnerable they just let it go that doesn't mean it didn't happen it did happen it's just that you got quote unquote lucky because that person didn't want to bury you because they also didn't want to damage their which is dumb anyway because you're not damaging your reputation you're not it's not a bad thing to be a victim something was done to you by force that was completely out of order completely out of line and if anything you should be trying to get whatever revenge and whatever justice that you can on a person by ruining their, their reputation their person you know whatever their livelihood everything if you can but i understand why they don't because of the you know, especially in England, like the, there's loads of rules around what, like the time frame you have to report it, um, the evidence that's needed to basically convict somebody. The conviction rate is super low. I think in like the single digit percentile, like it's fucking crazy. So I can understand why people don't want to report these type of things, but it doesn't mean they're not happening, especially in dance music scene, especially in nightlife where the lines are already blurred, you know, dark dance floor, people under people under the influence and shit. But this sort of stuff is really is worse in my opinion because this is stuff that's been done in daytime, you know. And and it's not you know it's not to excuse one or the one or the other. But when the lines are blurred, you could kind of see why things went that direction, right? And the kind of ramping up of the fucking situation. But in this type of situation where you're amongst friends and stuff, like this is probably way more confusing for the victim because you just can't make sense of it like hold on i was with my friend just a second ago i got introduced to this person who's a celebrity via a good friend of mine who i trust and who i love and i got you know what i mean you just can't process it because you're like hold on my friend knows you know what i mean like you just that's probably the thing that f fucks with their brain the most because it's done for a friendship way anyway this is bigger than me i'm very reserved i don't like calling people out and i don't want people to look at me like a victim but i need to speak about this because it's it's for everyone else that's been through this and to keep anyone else from going through this ever ra spoke to friends of sarah who supported her throughout the aftermath and there's a ra has seen the statements commenting this account um with reporting by annabelle ross so big up annabelle ross she's always doing amazing stuff in terms of calling out some of this horrible stuff that's happening in dance music you've got their support for sexual assault survivors down there below if you want to check it out on the article itself i'll put the link to the article there written down below in the description so you can check it out um this by a writer called anu sukau um so i'll definitely press uh, put that in the description so if you want to read it yourself you can um i guess the only lesson to be learned from this tour thing is that you should always trust your intuition always no matter how big the celebrity is no matter who the person is whatever your first instinct is even if you get it wrong you're better off trusting your intuition especially as a woman because you have no recourse later on if you do try to give them a chance because especially if it's a dude and they're bigger than you what can you do to defend yourself really you know what i mean when you get to that position there's really nothing you can do and you're kind of you kind of leaving yourself open to getting you know attacked abused or whatever it may be which is obviously terrifying so in this instance, I think women in general should just always go with their gut instinct. If somebody's giving you the ick, if somebody's giving you alarm bells, red flags, whatever the fucking term is, run a fucking mile. Never, ever give them an inch. Never give them an inch. And this kind of makes me think about the Juliana Huxable interaction and kind of makes me understand now why I got that frosty reaction. Maybe as a rule, it's like, look, anytime a straight presenting guy comes up to me, instant fuck off. If I'm not interested, instant fuck off because I don't know what your intentions are, but I'm not going to give you a fucking chance. You know, maybe that's a maybe that's a rule that most people within dance music, especially the women, even if you're not a DJ, if you're just kind of a, a proponent, a fan of it, that's what you should kind of go with. Anytime somebody comes up to you and you don't know them, especially if they're a straight presenting guy, a heteronormative dude, instant fucking block, instant lockdown, instant lockdown. And if you later find out, oh, no, that's an amazing guy. They're so nice. Okay, cool. I didn't know. Whatever. L, whatever. It is what it is. But you got enough friends anyway. You don't need any more. Fuck it. You know? Because when you give people a chance, look what fucking happens. Loads of them. Every single account here. Every single person in this account has said the same thing. I saw him first. Um, didn't like him. The Kylie person, the Jenna person, the Sarah person. They all had exactly the same visceral reaction to this guy when they first met him. Oh, this guy's a piece of shit not for me not for me not for me 
but they gave him a chance. Look what ended up happening. Again, force of feelings to everybody um, affected by this. I'm interested to see how the community or the scene overall reacts, especially with this guy being on Rhythm Section, which is I think it's on Rhythm Section, right? Which is a pretty big label here in in, in England, especially in South. Um, they kind of run that place over there and do a lot of good parties and put out a lot of good releases and shit. He's obviously very popular, even though I don't really know the guy too tough. I don't really listen to his music. People clearly like him and like what he does. So it'll be interesting to see how the scene overall reacts to it because the reason why these guys kind of get away with this sort of shit is because inadvertently this one guy pays for a lot of people's private schools he put he pays for a lot of people's mortgages he pays for a lot of people's fucking finance on their cars a lot of people are invested in making sure that Kamal Williams's music career is blossoming because it allows them to also have a rich and fulfilling life so they kind of turn a blind eye or look the other way because it's more advantageous to them but with these accounts and you'd imagine more accounts are probably going to come out as well because you know this is what happens usually when someone first comes out and kind of you know is brave enough to kind of speak out usually other people also come out and say you know what this also happened to me um if that is the case then we're definitely going to see something shit happen but um number one to be fair what's the what's with the name kamal williams anyway this guy looks like he's like mixed with white and an asian but then he has a name that like he sounds like he's some black dude from like detroit or something what's that all about maybe that's what that maybe that should have been a red flag this guy's called kamal williams but his real name's henry Wu. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what? He's he's already he, he was being devious from minute one, you know? But anyway, uh, absolutely horrendous report. Haters fucking see it, this type of thing. But again, another instance of like always trust your gut instincts as a woman out there in the scene. Always fucking trust your gut instincts because these guys out here are out here doing an absolute madness. You really can't trust anybody out there. You really cannot trust anybody. I swear to God you can't. I swear to God you cannot. Moving on. Let's talk about some clothing stuff. So we got this stuff regarding Tyshawn Jones and Adidas Skateboarding present the Tyshawn Jones 2. I'm actually a really big fan of this shoe. Um, I think Adidas Skateboarding have been doing some pretty cool things recently. I'm not going to lie. Um, so I'm glad to see Tyshawn getting this really nice pair of shoes here. Um, the Tyshawn 2s courtesy of ada skateboarding let's actually look at a closer image of the sh of the shoes i actually prefer the white and black pair they um that white and black type of colorway is really nice the color blocking on the midsole i've always been a fan of this actually when it's a white upper I'd have a completely black outsole i like the contrast of it it almost makes the white bit at the top almost look like it's floating so i kind of look at it i actually prefer the white colorway to the black one i think the black one kind of looks a little bit too Dare I say basic, even though it's a black and gum sole shoe, which I should always be a fan of. I quite like the makeup of the white pair. You've got a bit of black and white here. You've got some great underlays here under the tongue. You've also got a gum sole on them, so they look fucking nice. Um, really like the pair here. As you can see here, there's another colorway. There's another angle of the all black pair. The undersole, or the outsole, sorry, has... Um, I'm not sure if this is the same colorway for the Pan-African flag. The red, green, and thingy underneath there with the gum. Maybe that is, or maybe that's just him just... Maybe it's Caribbean roots. I'm not too sure. I really like the, the look of that, actually. But the white pair for me is the best one. And you've also got this nice big... You know, they almost look like tennis shoes, isn't it? They almost look like tennis shoes, in a way. This particular style. Um, it kind of reminds you of the times when... um, I forgot his fucking name. The skateboarder that always liked to wear, like, um, indoor soccer shoes or, like, AstroTurfs. It's like skateboarding shoes. I think it was Gino, right? Gino Iannucci. Iannucci. Um, he used to go out with Liam McSweeney, I think, back in the day as well, right? From Married to the Mob. But I remember he was the one that kind of popularized the trend of, like, wearing... And Jason Dill, actually, as well, of wearing, like, indoor soccer shoes. And indoor soccer shoes were always a really cool kind of, like, go-between or really cool alternative to skateboarding shoes if you wanted more of a sleeker silhouette back in the day because everything was so chunky. Because, obviously, indoor soccer shoes or badminton shoes or whatever they're me um they're very sticky they've got very sticky outsoles because you're usually playing on an indoor court with them so sticky outsoles are really good as well for skateboarding so obviously just to have you help your foot stabilize on the board itself so i really do like the look of these he looks fucking brilliant um let's actually look at the blurb it's been five years since Ada skateboarding teamed up with it's been five years since the type the first really five years oh god God damn it. Um, teed up with Tyshawn Jones to assemble the renowned skater's first signature shoe, the Adidas Tyshawn. Since then, the silhouette has been a staple with it being remastered several times to date, including the introduction of the low top iteration of this model. Now, Jones is set to drop the sequel of his shoe with a forthcoming release of the two. 
Uh, building from his uh, predecessor DNA detachment, two sports of familiar shape with several significant adjustments of his construction. The upper sports a durability orientated dual layer toe cap and a perforated toe box that emphasizes the breathability, while the midsole is backed by light strike technology to minimize weight and deliver an ample support. The three stripes return to each side of the midfoot, while the trifoil logo has been placed on the tongue and the golden Taishan text rest just above the lateral stripes. As for the initial color arrangements, the crystal white pair features an ample contrast, courtesy of the black stripes, laces and heel tap and midsoles. For those interested, the pairs are going to be available on June the 1st in crystal white colorway price. Wow, they're only $100. Pick up Taishan. I'm not sure if he was, if he was um, included in the pricing strategy of these, but big up Taishan. They're only $100. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm going to get a pair of these for, to if i'm not going to skate in them definitely to cycle they only 100 dollars so it's gonna be 100 but that's fucking great bro big up taishan 100 dollars that's pretty cool yeah i'm definitely gonna try and get a pair of these i actually don't like the black pair but if they're 100 dollars just to support the guy i'm actually trying to get both i'm not gonna lie because that's fucking cool big up him for putting together these shoes or like you know helping to design these shoes and also having them being priced 100 dollars. this is fucking banging you love to see this, bro. Honestly, I'm so happy to see this. Big up fucking Taishan. Wow. I love this. Um, We've got another image of them. Is that That's the one I just saw there, right? I think I just saw his already. Oh, no, it's another image of second to none. He looks so cool. Push. He's he's another one that looks really cool pushing, to be fair. Taishan's definitely not in that lineage of skaters that just look good pushing, you know? Just him pushing looks fucking cool. And he goes so fast. You know, it's so scary how fast he goes. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, they are. It kind of look like, yeah, they are. They're kind of like an, a level or lower, isn't it? Yeah. So there's a shoe by, Go um, what's, his, what's his face again? What's his name again? Um, Gons. Aloha. These are really nice. The all white pairs. I really regret not being able to get a pair of these. Actually, yeah, they, they do like a, they do look the same as the white a lower, isn't it? This particular pair, and I think it was take. I'm, I think the inspiration of this shoe was taken from that gallery. There's a picture of Gon skating in a gallery. Uh, where is it? And he's doing something, and he's got a pair of those shoes on. He's wearing like an all white outfit, and I think he's skating them. He does like, I think he goes around in a circle. I'm sure if you guys know, if I've got any skateboarders who listen to my podcast, you know what I'm talking about. There's a there's a picture of Mark Gonzalez skating somewhere in a gallery, and he's wearing like an all white outfit. Let me see, Mark Gonzalez. Uh, skateboarding art gallery yeah, skateboarding in art gallery and I think that's what the Aloha was based on it's him skateboarding and he's wearing a pair of white shoes so his particular shoe I think was based on that shoe he wore in the art gallery so either this one I'm not too sure which one was the first one I'm not too sure if the gum sole one I think it might be this clear I think these two were I think one of the first ones this particular one that has this clear outsole that's gone that's really fucking nice and also this particular one here so I think that's where it came from, this particular video of Mark Gonzalez skating in a museum in Germany, actually. This video is already nine years old. Uh, for the first time it showed, Mark did a performance in a German museum in Mönchengladbach on December the 13th, 1998. Wow. Really ahead of his time, Mark Gonzalez. So you see a picture here, it, there's an art gallery. You know what an art gallery looks like, white walls. Those are white people standing around. Mark Gonzalez comes in outfit skating around him. And this really cool outfit and then he goes up a ramp kind of and comes down. This is back when people were fascinated with skateboarding in this way. Nowadays it's not that big of a deal. But back in the day skateboarding was a bit counterculture, was a bit like, ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the establishment, right? And then this guy skating around. I think this is a longboard as well from the same time. Yeah, that might be an actual longboard too. <laughs> He's such a dream. Skating around this longboard, he's got a lower back of his face. Very Jason Neal-esque kind of outfit. Socks pulled up, nappy with the pushes, and his trousers tucked into the socks. Nice white coat, coat. wearing it. It looks like a shyster. He's got a black shyster on his back, dark skating in particular, going around the gym. Super fast around him. And just doing loads of shit. I would have preferred it actually if he would do a really corny thing and like covered his wheels in paint and then just skating around him. He's not going to look really just push it, right? When 
now the first one in to get. I forgot what the, 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 the actual word is like a bit of a tail. I think they can finish down with a dread. He was one of my inspirations. Instead of getting a regular side of skate with him, they can want to get one of those ones because of kind of way he was used to like skating around the streets of New York and then he was gone when he was out of the ship. It's like the first time to be the old like skating in the, in the rain. And he hit flips and pop shoves and big spins in the rain in New York when he skated. But the whole shit had fun and you go and try and you bust your face off. But yeah, this is where that shoot came from. That inspiration was based on that particular video. Um, and obviously the Taishan has some similarities between it. But I don't, I don't mind it. To, it's just like an update on it. I don't really, I don't take it as a diss, to be honest. But I guess some people in skateboarding want always new things. Um, so yeah, so people are not the not the best of them. Not the most biggest fans of them. But I quite like them. Yeah, exactly. Someone says they're, they're very sambery. Um, again, just a cool type of shoe. Um, the quality doesn't look the greatest. I'm not going to lie. The leather doesn't look the greatest. But for a hundred bucks, you can't go too bad to get a pro model shoe. I don't. I, I can't. I can't remember the last skateboarding pro model that you'd get for a hundred dollars. Like, does that even exist? Usually, they charge way more for the pro model. So the fact that he's giving you a pro model shoe with his fucking name on the side, you know, being skater of the year and shit, and being an absolute boss. For a hundred bucks, you have to give the kid ratings, man. Give the kid ratings. That's fucking brilliant. Whoever decided to do that, you did a fucking great job. So big up Tyshawn. Tyshawn 2s look fucking cool. Um, I think there's actually a video of what's her name? There's actually an image of Tracy Ellis Ross wearing them, right? It's a really good pull. Tracy Ellis Ross. So big up Tyshawn for sending those those shoes to her. I think she's wearing the Tyshawn, Tyshawn Jones shoes. So that's pretty cool link up. So big up him for giving her a pair. Cause I feel like that's way more of a cooler link up than giving some nonsense influence that we always see wearing them so big up um this paul big up this uh this is really good seeding in my opinion this is really fucking good seeding um giving trace Ellis taste tracy ellis ross a pair and she obviously freaked them in a really cool way this nice big boxy t-shirt tucked into some big boxy leather pants and the shoes there at the bottom look really fucking cool so again the proof that you can wear them and look nice in terms of a lifestyle way and obviously in also a normal way a skateboarding way and she's obviously tagged it really cool um caption here says thanks hi sean for these really cute sneaks do you still think i'll be able to skate now i want to jump over things like you so amazing big up tracy ellis ross we fucking love to see it really cool she she freaked them really well and i can't wait to get a pair myself when they never to be do drop big up ty sean jones big up blood clark ty sean jones moving on from that moving on from that let's talk a little bit about these ami leon door ami leon door have just released pictures of their brand new brand new new balance 1000 pack by teddy santa so interesting um interesting clarification on that i'm not too sure if that's where if that's how they're going to be named but according to my guy over at over and under over and under posted this particular tweet regarding the shoe itself and he says emilion door and new balance 1000 pack by teddy santa so i'm not too sure if they're going to be called by teddy santa or if it's just an ald pair but either way the shoe themselves is really fucking cool. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the one. To be fair, the one thousand is a weird one because when I've seen them in product shots, they look really cool. But then when I saw somebody wear them, like in lifestyle shot on Instagram, they didn't look that great. So I'm not too sure if I'm just seeing things or if they don't look as good as I think they look. I'm not too sure. But either way, um, they kind of remind me. Again, this is a weird way to say this. Don't fucking kill me. But they kind of remind me a little bit, a little bit of a Yeezy Wave Runner, the Yeezy 700, and a little bit of an Air Max 95. They almost have like a, if New Balance made an Air Max 95 without air bubbles, or if New Balance made a, maybe it's a front as well, that kind of reminds you of a Wave Runner, of, you know what I mean? That kind of front bit, the, the, the tip there. But the shoe itself is fucking phenomenal. Um, I like the paneling, because I think you can do similar sort of like 95 type paneling with this sort of like Wave design here on the side. Um, they just look really cool. Uh, they look a bit more sleek, less bulky than your traditional New Balance that you're used to. And to be fair, Teddy Santis, ALD, they're really pros when it comes to colorways. In the same way that Kif is, right? In the same way that I forgot his fucking name from Kif. Master at colorways. Master. Like, colorway design is a field in itself that I think gets overlooked these days because everyone wants to make their own kind of like custom pair from the ground up. But I think the ability to put together a really good, nice color, a really nice colorway, especially when you're going this monochromatic tone down vibe, because, you know, this, bla this black pair with the contrast and stitching, like, if you know anything about me, you know how much of a sucker I am for contrast, contrast and stitching. Maybe it's a nigga 
nigger in me, but I love a good black with white stitching. Like I fucking love it. And this looks so fucking sublime. Like, and he could have easily went a bit too crazy with the midsole and added a bit more whites on these gray bits and stuff to make it pop more. But he just left it alone. Left it alone. So you got here, you got this nice black upper with the white stitching. You've got different reflection of different materials. So you've got like what looks like a patent leather here. You've got what looks like, I don't know if that's like a if that, I don't know if that's like perforated or maybe something with a mesh different type of material here on the front you've got mesh here you've got different I think you've got like normal leather eyelets here as also well. different types of materials and different I always love that appeal or love that design choice or colorway choice where you have the same color but then you have different materials so the colorway sits differently on the material itself so if you have like an all black shoe or you have like a suede a suede logo um pattern tip and like a new buck heel counter they kind of give it a different type of tonality even though it's the same colorway so i really like how that looks in the front and obviously the laces as well you've got these nice speckled um laces here round ones which kind of give it a little bit more of an outdoory rugged feel but each colorway is really sublime you can't go wrong with either of them the black the all gray and the white maybe the all whites are probably the, the, the my favorite look at how that looks like if you put it under the you know, if you if you if you shine a light on it and you just let the fucking the black pop out, look at that. That looks that looks incredible. Um, so the text here, courtesy of Hype, he says, as we wrap up the month of May, Teddy Santos once again offered a preview of his forthcoming Amelion Door New Balance One Thousand project. This time, unveiling a third colorway in all grey. With our best look at the current collaboration, each pair sports an Ami branding at the front. Oh yeah, true. You got the Ami brand. I didn't I didn't even spot that at the beginning. Yeah. Pretty cool at the front. Um, we got the T, the, the, the silhouette, time showcase in black colorway with Ami on the front with the branding. And obviously you got this colorway too that gives you a little idea on what it looks like in hand. But you've also got this picture courtesy of my guy from over and under. He posted this pretty cool picture so you can get an, another kind of look at what this actually looks like. Let me get this freaking thing off the screen. Bear with me a second here. There you go. But the actual shoe itself looks fucking hard, isn't it? Even from, even from, the, even from below. And even with, because I'm not really a fan of putting your eye your laces through like this sort of like tongue eyelet thing i know it helps to keep the tongue in place but i'm not really a fan of this i'd actually prefer to have it outside but the fact that it still looks good like this is proof that it's a really fucking hard colorway and again that front definitely looks like a 700 that looks exactly like a 700 there at the front that bit there right that tip looks so fucking cool um i love the fact that you got the emmy written here on the logo on the tongue sorry um label there new balance 1000 you've got this perforated mesh type of inner sole there maybe that helps with the breathability of it you've got this separate heel counter bit here as well which i also like the look of the nice piping around the edges there i'm assuming this might be 3m around the seams here this piping maybe some 3m here on the eyelets as well so again it's got a lot of air max 95 vibes about it a lot of air max 95 vibes about it. like new balance have a really deep archive of really cool interesting runner type shoes man they should try and be pushing out more often and obviously look at how they look like in natural light oh, they look so good the all white and all black pair are probably the ones that people should be going for that they look so fucking good or you obviously see this person got a pair of the sample pairs obviously you got sample in there maybe the actual retail version won't look like these maybe they might tone down or might tone up some bits of the white um but overall these look so good all white pair this kind of like i think on a black is patent i'm not sure if this is patent still this looks like a clear outer heel thing which is also represented in the, in the logo on the side this is a really cool effect this almost clear plastic thing on the outside here on the bottom this looks really cool because you imagine as you wear it this will obviously die and turn into a yellowy-ish kind of color and it will offset really well with the midsole and just give it a really cool vintage type of look to it so i'm a big fan of that i'm not gonna lie and um, i also like the salt like it just, it just looks cool to be fair it doesn't look as clunky it looks a bit more sleek it looks like an mx95 mixed with the 700 but done in a very new balancey type of way and i'm assuming this will obviously lead to the retros of these coming out later and i think there's really a, a shoe that i think there's a video really colorway i saw i think it's like a silver one so clearly they're going to be having more i think i saw santander wearing them um but i really like this shoe honestly i really fucking like this shoe and um what's the date on release so far we have a date for them uh new balance is celebrating okay it's the 25th anniversary of the new balance 1000 this year so they're gonna bring it back there's no idea when they're gonna be released but they're aiming to have a price of 170 dollars at some point but no idea when they will release but they look fucking phenomenal i love everything about them and i can't wait to wear them myself when they do eventually drop when they do eventually drop 
Anyways, my friends, that's been the Axino Zinger Show episode number 781. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's your first time checking out the show, checking out the podcast, make sure that you like my thing down below, wherever you're going to be watching it on YouTube, whatever, later on the line, like it down below. If you're listening via the podcast on the Apple side of things, please make sure that you give this podcast a five-star review as well as flipping Spotify, help the kid out a little bit. That would be greatly appreciated. And obviously links to the show, links to all the topics I spoke about will also be um, included in the description of this podcast itself for the tune of the day i'm gonna play a bit of beak beak the tune is called windmill hill courtesy of the new album which is dash dash i guess what's that symbol called better than better than better than better than but if you type in beak better than symbol you'll be able to find it the tune is called windmill hill that's my tune of the day today thank you so much for tuning in today and i'll see you again very 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 soon take care my people peace <laughs>